we wanted to uh, move on to the next session uh, where we will have Ben Kopp uh, from the Canadian government speaking about Canada's journey to the net zero transition, the kinds of policies and regulations the Canadian government is putting in place in order to help lead us through this journey. Thank you so much. Thanks, John Viev, and thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, it is really great to be here today, and uh, it's great to be back uh, on the West Coast. I'm born and raised West Coaster, so any chance to come back here professionally is always uh, always a good opportunity. Of course, I get to see a Seahawks fan right out of the gate here from uh, in the audience, which is which is always a good thing. Uh, good win for the Canucks last night too. Um, so um, it's nice to be here, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to follow Jean Viev's lead, and I do feel it's always very important to start any of these presentations um, with a land acknowledgement. And, uh, and it's an honor to be here and acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, a beautiful spot here in, in this part of Vancouver. And uh, it's very important that we kind of contextualize all of our work. And, and I will touch a little bit on um, our work with Indigenous groups across Canada, a little bit of my presentation today as well, too. Um, so the overview of my, or the objective of my presentation today will be, will be threefold. Um, I'm going to try to contextualize a little bit, as Jean Viev said, um, our, our government's overarching climate agenda. I'll try to provide a bit of a sense of the work that we are already undertaking to decarbonize uh, the built environment in Canada. I think for those of you that were on the tours yesterday, um, I think had a really good chance to see some uh, really interesting sort of different parts of the built environment and the work that is either, you know, beginning already or, or will be beginning uh, to help decarbonize the built environment across Canada. Um, and to talk a little bit about the challenges and the path ahead for the government um, and more broadly for, for, for this sector as a whole. So let's begin a little bit with sort of the overarching view on our climate plan, you know, and the impetus to better conserve the energy that we already use. You know, regardless of the type of energy that we use today, like I think most in this room would agree that, you know, in order to be more efficient with our energy use, we need to have, you know, systems that are stable, you know, reliable, and certainly right now uh, affordable. And this is really that kind of like cross-section of that, of that question. Um, you know, I think given, given that kind of, you know, nexus of those issues, that's why, you know, energy efficiency has been a major part of the gov governments, the government of Canada, as well as provincial governments, city governments across Canada, um, in terms of our emissions reduction strategy, you know, it is really, it does account for about one third of our planned emissions reductions, uh, in Canada. Um, so it is, you know, a very, very important part of our work. Um, and the, and the challenge ahead, uh, is really, really immense and it is very significant. Um, I think a lot of you, but just to maybe sort of contextualize sort of the environment a little bit, just to make sure we're kind of all on the same page before I jump in. Um, you know, in order to, you know, you know, meet our targets, global greenhouse gas emissions, you know, need to be halved by 2030, you know, for the world to limit its temperature increase to 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius, you know, and deep reductions are needed to reduce the impacts of climate change. However, in its first uh, global stock take, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change concluded that the world is not on track to meet its, its goal of 1.5% um, you know, above pre-industrial levels. Canada is taking action on a number of fronts, but it remains clear that implementation needs to accelerate and action needs to be more ambitious. You know, it needs to take an all society approach um, and uh, to make progress towards our Paris goals and to respond you know, to the climate crisis more broadly. And I'll re reiterate this point a couple of times in my presentation today, it will be very important for all of us to work together. You know, the Pan-Canadian Framework uh, and the Emissions Reduction Plan for the Government of Canada outlined how we will be achieving our goals of 40%, 40 to 45% below 2005 levels by 2030, and net zero emissions by 2050 across all economic sectors. You know, our emissions reduction plan specifically re released in 2022 presents, uh, you know, an achievable but very ambitious roadmap to, to getting to where we want to get to by 2030 and to, to more... Uh, more broadly accelerate our work by 2050 towards that net zero goal. 
Um, there are big sectors that we need to address. Oil and gas, about 26% of Canada's emissions. Transportation, 25%. Buildings, 12%, and I'll touch on that number uh, in my presentation. And then down through heavy industry, agriculture, electricity, waste, and other sectors. Um, but we have some big big sectors that need to be addressed, and there our built environment is, is one of them. So today my focus will largely be on, on the building's environment, as that is kind of the focus of the work that we do in the Office of Energy Efficiency, you know, and the challenges that we need to address. Are, are really significant. So for context, you know, more than 80% of the building stock in Canada um, in 2030 will be made up of buildings that are already here today. So most of our buildings that we have here today, they are still going to be here in 2030. You know, it's not like we can start, start fresh with buildings necessarily that are, all, that are all net zero. It is going to be a challenge of looking at the building stock that already exists. On the emission side, our built environment is responsible, as I said, for 13% of total national greenhouse gas emissions. But when you start to add on offsite generation of electricity for the use in buildings, that number increases to about 18%. You know, when you start to like look at like more further further at, at the building materials such as steel and concrete that are used in buildings, that number starts to tick up even further. So we're looking at that sort of you know operational versus um, you know embodied carbon question. And, and and when we start to kind of look at the buildings as a as an entity, a single entity, but then looking more beyond that at sort of the carbon that goes into the products that we are using to, to build our buildings, you know, that percentage goes up. So it, it is really um, you know, a big, big challenge, and uh, and and we so we need to be looking at this from a number of different perspectives. You know, one of the key areas has to be you know the way that we heat and cool our homes. That is, homes and buildings. Uh, it's not just our homes. Over 78% of operational building emissions in Canada come from space and water heating functions. You know, which is largely based on the use of fossil fuel equipment and a low um, a low uh, envelope efficiency levels. So, like things like air leakage. But certainly, that you know how we like heat and cool our homes is a is a major part of again homes and buildings a major part of our emissions. So, electrifying space and water heating. Is and through the installation of heat pumps, you know, is an essential component of decarbonizing the building sector, you know, while also um, uh, helping with the resilience question at the same time. You know, with the low cost of many fossil fuels still, natural gas in particular, long technology lifespans and relatively high upfront technology costs, decarbonizing the building sector will require a multifaceted approach that leverages the commitment of, of all players involved. So it, not just governments, and I will again repeat that again, um, but it really does need to be an all sector approach. So that has kind of led us to developing, we're still in the midst right now, developing a green building strategy for Canada, which is a key pillar under our, our government's emissions reduction plan, you know, again, and in line with the goal of getting to net zero by 2050. So a major pillar of that was the development of a green building strategy for Canada. Our department is leading that work, but in collaboration, you know, with colleagues in this room as well, too, uh, other federal departments, provinces and territories, as well as partners in a lot of different sectors across the country. This is not a federal government strategy. This is a national strategy that we're trying to develop with all partners. And, and we've been working on it for more than, more than a year now. And I'm assuming that you know will always brings chuckles a bit with the government and and its and its speed, but it really needs to be a strategy that does bring sectors together in, in the best way possible. Ideally, we will have an evergreen strategy. Now to 2050 is a long ways off. The technologies that exist today, um, the strategies that we have in place, you know, the programs, et cetera, might not be the ones that we, we need in five years' time and 10 years' time. So when we launch this strategy, our intent is to really make, make sure that the strategy can, can continue to be an evergreen strategy and continue to adapt and evolve to, to give us the best opportunity to get to net zero by 2050. But I think we do know it needs to, to, to look at three key objectives. It needs to look at building net zero and resilience from the start. We need to accelerate the rate of deep retrofits across Canada. And we need to transform space and water heating, as I already mentioned. Over the last year, we've engaged uh, in extensive consultations with partners you know, across the country to get the strategy right. We've met with industry associations, had multiple rounds of engagement with provinces and territories. Again, worked closely with our own federal colleagues. We've engaged our indigenous partners, um, you know, as well as other groups across the country to make sure that we have a strategy that is comprehensive of views of, of all groups that have a, have a stake in this game. Uh, we have heard about uh, feedback about the importance of access to capital. Uh, significantly, as well as the climate and energy use data that we need, a good use of data to, to support decision making. You know, we've heard about the need to expand the workforce, workforce being critical, making sure that our workforce is skilled, expanded, so that we can address this problem in a, in a way that is 
you know, at the pace that we need to address it at, um, to be, and also really to accelerate that pace of decarbonizing our buildings. We've also heard about the importance of increasing public awareness about what the transformation process means. I still don't think we have, you know, a good sense of, or we have a sense of it, we don't necessarily have full, that full awareness, I think, across Canada about what this actually means and what can be done. Um, and that sort of goes into industry, goes into the sectors, goes into the, you know, the front line of, of, of people working with homeowners and business owners about how they can make their make their buildings more efficient. We need to be better at, you know, how we, how we get messages out in Canada and again I don't think that is uh, just a government to Canadians message that you know the messaging from industry from industry associations from those people that are that are working most closely with homeowners I think that messaging needs to be consistent and it needs to make sure that it is meaningful to uh, to Canadians uh, and again ultimately the strategy needs to be one with multiple levers you know it does need to include a mix of sticks and carrots you know one that drives action from across the sector and again, it'll need to be evergreen and, and evolve over time. So we have started, obviously, to take action on a number of different fronts. You know, our office, um, the Office of Energy Efficiency, as well as, you know, partners in other federal departments has increased significantly. Our office over the last uh, number of years has doubled in size. And I think that speaks to the investment in this, in this area and how important, you know, energy efficiency is overall to government policy. We have a number of initiatives that are already in play um, with significant investments to you know, homeowners, to businesses, to, to bigger industry. Our Canada Greener Homes Initiative is kind of one of our biggest ones right now, which, which uh, supports homeowners directly. Uh, we have issued more than almost $400 million in grant funding to date to homeowners. You know, and what this does provide from a grant perspective is, you know, $5,000, so barely nominal to some extent to homeowners to, you know, to make their homes more efficient um, and, uh, and to do things like, you know, being, change windows, change doors, bring in heat pumps, et cetera. Um, and so where we can, we are working with provinces and territories to co-deliver um, this initiative, which makes it easier for those in jurisdictions to access funding, both from the federal government, but also programs of a similar nature where, these, where the funds can be stacked uh, with our provincial partners. There's also a, a program being run by our Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which is a loan program kind of run in parallel to the, the grant program that provides um, interest-free loans for 10 years, up to $40,000 to do the, the similar kind of upgrades uh, to homes so people can combine those two together. Uh, and most recently, we have launched an uh, oil the heat pump affordability program under the same umbrella, which provides another $5,000 to people in Canada who currently heat their homes on oil uh, and expensive heating oil to be able to install electric heat pumps in their homes and to combine for, for people in, in sort of that low medium income bracket and to combine that $5,000 with the $5,000 from the, the, the bigger program as well too. So really from that lens as well, both from an energy efficiency standpoint, but also from an energy affordability standpoint is supporting Canadians um, in, that, in that way. Um, we also offer evaluation tools and certification programs for homes and buildings. The Enter Guide and Energy Star are kind of our big, you know, flagship initiatives in that sense to help Canadians make better decisions about the um, about their buildings' energy use. We are looking at at ways to make these programs more mainstream. About you know, one one of the things that we are looking at right now is the possibility of Enter Guide labeling at homes for the time of sale, so people are aware of the efficiency in homes when they are looking to purchase a home. So moving sort of outside of that homeowner world and into sort of the resident, like the, the broader sector, um, like in terms of the small home um, aspect, we have a $200 million fairly recent program to accelerate deep retrofits across Canada uh, and looking to find accelerator organizations to help building owners in the development of deep retrofit projects for commercial, commercial institutional and mid, mid to high uh, rise residential buildings. Um, so we're really trying to sort of increase the capacity across Canada and capacity being kind of the key part of that um, to, to do more of these projects and to really accelerate that rate. We know $200 million, you know, isn't, isn't hugely significant, but it's significant enough to start to again, build that momentum, to build that capacity, to make, to help these projects kind of continue kind of going forward. Um, 
on building codes, we have invested $100 million in the Code Accelerator Fund, which is supporting projects you know, geared towards accelerating the adoption and implementation of the highest feasible tiers of the national model. Um, building codes uh, and other high performance building codes um, with the funding it promotes the higher rates of compliance with adopted codes um, and build capacity in the market uh, for really sort of ambitious code adoption. You know, We are seeing that sort of ambitious code adoption right here in BC, I think a bit of a trailblazer province in terms of its work kind of to to get building codes adopted at the highest level. Um, and, uh, you know, BC has certainly been been a leader in this for some time. Um, the clean BC roadmap to 2030, you know, is, is gradually lowering emissions from buildings, you know, until all buildings can be net zero with that focus on, on 2030 for, for BC. You know, the BC zero carbon step code, you know, is voluntary, but it but already municipalities in the province are taking it up. Um, and I think sort of continuing to spur on other, other municipalities to, to do the same. Um, same at the, at the same rate, there's jurisdictions in, in BC already, uh, Victoria, Sandwich, Nanaimo, to name a few uh, jurisdictions that are looking to phase out, you know, fossil fuel based, you know, primary heating in their in their areas. Again, I think really kind of trying to sort of lead that charge for, you know, across the province and, and lots of good examples in BC to be looking at as well as elsewhere in Canada, but certainly being here in BC, it's a chance to, you know, speak about the good work that is already happening here. You know, on the community scale, we have a greener neighborhoods pilot program, you know, which is providing, you know, 35.5 million to support up to, you know, six low rise community neighborhood developments. Um, so, you know, similar work to, you know, sort of that sort of like acceleration initiatives, but looking at, at community housing. Um, and work that we already do with our Green Municipal Fund through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. You know, we're helping cities, you know, towns and communities, you know, look at sort of specific green buildings activities, you know, significant investments from the Government of Canada into, you know, specific projects that municipalities come forward with and, and we're seeing some really good, good action there. So again, the, you know, the Greener Homes Initiative, which was, you know, launched as a, as a $2 billion initiative, um, added on to another $250 million to get people off of, um, um, for oil and into heat pumps. Our budget 22 put $600 million into investments in the, in the initiatives that I mentioned, deep retrofits, you know, greener neighborhoods, accelerating codes, and some other initiatives as well too, um, which has kind of led to that, you know, that, that, that the expansion of the work and the expansion of our team in the Office of Energy Efficiency. And, and, you know, I like to think that, you know, this work will continue. I think it, you know, Obviously, you know, as political, um, you know, situations can change. This work is, you know, and I'll talk about this in a, in a couple of seconds here, but, you know, this work really does have a major focus on, on the environment. It has a major focus on the economy, has a focus on jobs. You know, and I think with this momentum that we're already developing here, we want to see this, you know, continue to grow and continue to develop. Um, so with that, you know, I also want to acknowledge, you know, I do want to acknowledge a couple of things in a bit more detail um, in areas that we are focused on. One is on Indigenous communities and, and second on the workforce. So we're having this conversation about like greening buildings in the broader context of a, a very significant housing crisis that we are seeing across Canada. And, and certainly it, it, does, it goes without saying that, you know, building homes in Indigenous communities in Canada you know, just having quality homes is the, is the challenge. Um, that is the challenge that communities want us to address. And we are working, you know, with our partners across the government and also with communities to say, okay, how can we do this from a perspective that gets what we need and that's better quality homes and communities, but also resilient and well-built homes and ones that are, you know, hopefully net zero at the same time. Um, but we do need to make sure that, you know, the, the benefits of green buildings are available to all um, and making sure that we are sort of addressing sort of the green buildings equation at the same time as we're addressing housing and affordability issues. Um, you know, I think good progress, you know, is being made. We are continuing to support, you know, communities in terms of their housing priorities, but, you know, I think it again goes without saying that it's not happening you know fast enough we are having good conversations we are trying to as best we can understand kind of what those needs are and and make sure that we are you know moving as quickly as we can still a lot to work to do but you know i, I we're hopeful that we can continue to kind of move these objectives together in parallel you know our workforce and skills training you know it's it is you know, decarbonizing the building sector is a critical step, you know, but that contractors and, you know, skilled trades need to be at the heart of this, of our work. This, we, we spend a lot of time, I think the, the grand majority of, of speaking engagements that I do or panel discussions are with our industry associations and, and you know, and, and what I do feel is that when we are talking to, again, I, I use the term frontline, but, you know, workers that are, that are, that are, 
working directly with business and, and homeowners, you know, that, that they're there in terms of what is needed. They're supportive of it, you know, but they also need the support of government to, you know, how, how can we go faster? How can we be more, you know, clear? And I think that's the work that we're trying to do in our building strategy, you know, but, you know, we are faced with this challenge that, you know, from what our, you know, data shows us that one in five, you know, skilled trade workers are, are going to set to retire in the next five years. You know, so we do need to be focusing on our ability to to train more people, to, to reskill people, to focus on, you know, colleges and, and universities in terms of, you know, that, you know, getting a workforce that can um, address the, the challenge that is ahead of us. Um, you know, but we are already experiencing it, like naturally, I think like across lots of sectors, delays in the ability to, to do the work that is needed because of the challenges in the workforce. Um, you know, so we are working with our colleagues that, that sort of lead on workforce issues in the government of Canada, but also working with our provincial colleagues as well too, in terms of their program to make sure that we're, you know, supporting, you know, workforce development, um, you know, our most recent, uh, like fall economic statement last year announced $250 million, you know, for a sustainable jobs and training center. Um, this is again, only a small part of it, um, but the intent here is to support about 15,000 um, workers to upgrade and, and gain new skills for, for jobs in the low carbon economy. Um, so yeah, like those are the big challenges ahead. Lots of work to do for sure. Again, I will reiterate that, you know, yes, this is uh, the, the strategy that we're developing now is meant to be comprehensive. The programs that I mentioned are meant to be, you know, sort of as part of the strategy. There is going to be need. There is going to. Uh, there is a need to do more, um, and certainly, as I mentioned, and, and the discussions that we're we're still continuing to have is like, what is that right kind of blend of you know the incentive-based programs that I have mentioned, and you know the the, the need for governments to, to take action to say, okay, here's what we what we are going to do, and here's you know how fast we need to do it. So like that challenge is something that, and hence why we're taking some time to kind of work through this, is we want to make sure we get that equation right, that we develop a strategy that is going to give us the best chance to to address you know our immediate climate change goals and really work towards that bigger goal um, of 2050 you know and i think the world is there with us um, you know we've had some chance to spend some time overseas and have you know, talks from, you know, IEA events uh, where bring countries are coming together to, to talk about energy efficiency for days. And, you know, and certainly it has been, you know, uh, on the forefront of, of lots of governments, certainly in Europe, uh, looking at the global energy crisis and the rising cost of living, living and climate change, you know, challenges, you know, across the world. Um, it is, you know, a challenge that, you know, I think the, the world is coming together and we're, you know, need to be there, you know, with other countries. Um, this needs to be kind of the decade of action. We, we do need significant investments in order to, to get there. Um, and I think that work will continue in Canada. And again, we, we need to make sure that work is happening, you know, across all sectors, you know, collaboratively, so we can figure out what that, what the right approach is going forward and, and make sure that we have a strategy that we can continue to work with, continue to evolve, you know, continue to make progress on to, to make sure that we can, we can address this major challenge. Thank you. Oh yeah, sorry, yes. I, I was trying to look what the time was, but uh, I think we have some time for questions. Perfect. Any, uh, any questions? I think there's a mic, there's a mic here. Oh, get one there. Hi, thanks for that. I'm curious about the timeline for when we can expect to see the green building strategy. Yeah, and so that's uh, well, and that is the uh, you know the the question each time like uh, I or we um, other colleagues uh, come and talk about our work, um, you know our intent is to 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 have this finished this year. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I know we're, we have people from a variety of different sectors, but certainly, you know, as we work through our, our process in, in government, we, we have wanted to make sure that as we, as we finalize and work through this strategy that we, you know, again, as I mentioned, it, it is, is meant to be evergreen. So we, we know that, you know, whatever strategy we come out with, we want it to be as comprehensive as we can, but also understanding that, you know, it is going to need to change and it is going to need to evolve. And uh, so I think we're close. Um, we are kind of finalizing, you know, the, the, the final bits now in terms of the, you know, what we need to have internally to, 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 to get it out to be public. And our, our intent is to have it done by this year, end of this year.
course. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paula. I work in sustainability consulting. And I'm interested in knowing what you would like to see provincial governments do to support in this work. That's a great question. And I think provincial governments are already doing a lot of what, um, like what we are, I think, working with them on. We've had multiple rounds of conversations. We are working closely with you know, our provincial colleagues, you know, understanding the different political environments that exist in, in each jurisdiction. And I think, you know, certainly in, in some jurisdictions, they, it's, we're not, we're not waiting for you, the federal government, we're, and BC is a good example of that. There's a lot of work that that's already happening. Um, you know, certainly the conversations that, that we're having at officials level, but it's also happening at, you know, I think the political level as well too, um, you know, to try to align as best we can to, to do the work around, you know, building codes with those in each jurisdiction that have the responsibility for for codes to 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 be more more ambitious to to be able to kind of move further up you know and certainly you know that world of you know how, how do we kind of create the sort of the right blend of you know incentives and other you know measures to make sure that we are you know again making that transition you know as smooth as possible supporting Canadians, certainly low-income Canadians, to make that transition. And that, that is some of the bigger challenges, you know, ahead, right, is, you know, yeah, like the, the, the path to net zero can be, you know, okay, well, this seems simple. We will just, we could do this, and that will require, you know, houses to become, you know, net zero by, by X date. But, like, the, the challenge is much greater than that when you look at sort of the, the diversity of Canada, income levels across the country, the differences between north and south and the access to energy in, in various parts of the country. It's not a, it's not a linear problem. And, uh, you know, I think probably, you know, could have opened with, you know, I've been in government and policy now for coming up on 20 years and, you know, advising cabinets and, and treasury on a variety of different issues. This is the, the big challenge. This is the, you know, I haven't seen many challenges that I think are quite this big from the dollars investment that's going to be required, you know, the amount of, you know, political sort of impetus to kind of, you know, make it happen, the need to work closely with our communities across the country to get provinces in line, to go back to your question, like I think it, it is an alignment thing, but also to be, you know, as ambitious and aggressive as, as possible while also ensuring that, you know, people in jurisdictions, um, and again, it's, again, the problem is, is the challenges are different in each jurisdiction, but that, you know, we're continuing to, to address those to the extent that's possible. Hi. Hi, I'm Genevieve from Pomerlou Construction. Okay. Um, just a quick question. I was curious to understand, we're always talking about the build environment like as buildings only. Mm -hmm. Why are we not including the civil and infrastructure also built environment into the question and the plan? So the what, what, what was The civil and infrastructure oh, yeah. built yeah. environment. Yeah, and I think it, it is, and I think that sort of comes into that broader question of, you know, everything. So it is like, yeah, the building itself, as I mentioned, but it is like the equation is, you know, much broader than that. And as I mentioned, when you start to kind of look beyond, you know, just that sort of structure itself that you, like the... The, the, the challenge becomes, you know, quite significant. And Jean-Vivre and I were saying this like, as part of the tour yesterday, I know that you were part of the tour, went to the airport as well too. And as sort of YVR is looking at the equation from, yeah, the facility, but also all the different aspects of what is required for an airport, the transportation coming in, the vehicles, the planes, the, you know, everything that's kind of going into it. I think that it is a, like a much broader question. And uh, if I, you know, didn't touch on that enough like that, yeah, it certainly is part of the, like the big broader equ equation. Good. I think we're uh, got to move on. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Oh, I see one. Well, I guess we could do one more, but it's one minute. Okay. Who is it? Maybe keep it short there, Ben, if you can. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, morning, everyone. Marcellus from Elliston Construction Services. Uh, my question is, is are you guys going to be focusing any attention on the academic side of things? So, uh, a course that comes to mind is the uh, Renewable Energies Technology course at Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. Yeah. Is there going to be any assistance to um, students to educate people in the future to kind of be more knowledgeable about how to roll out some of these innovations? Yeah, and as I said, like we, we do work with our partners at our, our sort of 
department and federal department that does focus on on jobs and coming back to the question on you know provinces like a lot of that does fall into provincial jurisdiction so what we are trying to what we try to do understanding the challenge that exists is okay what can we do from the levers that we have federally and then working closely with our provinces to make sure that we're supporting curricula in in colleges that that are going to allow the workforce to to develop and skill and grow the way that we know it needs to thank you thank you